thank you so much. I want to uh, do a big shout out for Jerry and Sergi with CanBIM for putting on this great event. We're super excited to be here. Uh, I also want to thank all of the attendees for showing up. I know that there, uh, especially these days, there are uh, all sorts of things competing for our attention, and we're certainly glad that you took the time out for, for this presentation. Uh, my name again is Rick Deans. I'm with an organization called Innate, and what we do is we provide an integrated project controls platform that really touches every aspect of construction from pre-construction all the way over to uh, asset commissioning and turnover. What we're going to be talking about today is our integrated platform and how it can connect cost estimates and electronic models, something we're really, really excited about. Uh, a little bit about myself. I used to round up and say I've been with the organization for 20 years. Now I round down and say I've been with the organization for a little, little over 20 years. It's been an, an interesting journey. We've been acquired by one of our largest organizations that also acquire our largest customers that has also acquired some other tools and as a result has really created a unique value proposition in the market for like i said earlier an integrated project controls platform and today we're going to talk a little bit about how to avoid project surprises um, through the use of an integrated platform like ours i first wanted to start off by just talking about some of the challenges that face folks in the pre-construction estimating world today. And it didn't take me long to come up with this, and, and we probably could have spent the entire 20 minutes talking about challenges that face estimators today. One of them is that uh, detailed results are expected when there is a lack of detail. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as we as we go in uh, to our presentation here. Um, you know, one of the things that we run into a lot is that it's difficult to find cost and productivity history on similar types of work. So we know we've done stuff like in the, this in the past. Uh, in fact, I've, I've sat in many meeting rooms where, where people have been very animated about this discussion. We've done this kind of work here for X number of years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years in, in some cases, and there's not a single place I can go to see what it cost and, and what sort of effort was required to build that work. Uh, time is precious, and it, it really seems that the expectations in the industry are that estimates are just picked off a shelf, right? Just go to that shelf, pick off the estimate, and get it to me by 3 o'clock this afternoon. Um, and and that's just not the reality of, of the situation, right? We, there are a lot of a lot of hard work and, and, and analysis needs to go in to that process to, to develop a good estimate. Um, sometimes we see variability of costs and productivity based on different conditions or different factors that are served up to us. So for instance, where we're doing the work, right? The geography, the location. Um, the availability of skilled trades. It's not uncommon at all, for instance, in the power industry to have planned outages in the spring and fall when demand for power services is at a, a, a lull. So you know, are we gonna be able to bring the, the skilled trades in to work on our asset at that, at that particular time? Uh, seasonality, right? Uh, doing something in uh, Edmonton or Fort McMurray in January is a whole lot different than doing something uh, in, in hurricane season in, in the Gulf of Mexico, for instance. Um, and then there's logistics, right? Um, are we going to be able to get the materials? Are we going to be able to get things to our job site in an orderly fashion where we can warehouse them and, and be able to draw upon them? So a lot to consider. And like I said, we could have spent numerous uh, slides just talking about this. But one of the things that and then of course we've got unknowns right the known unknowns we want to account for in every estimate we just don't know what they're going to be but one of the things that that i think really strikes home with a lot of the people that i talk to in the industry is that estimating is not a linear process there's not a clear progression between step a and step b and step c and step d 
In fact, I, I was trying to, to model out what it might look like, and the best I could come up with was something like this, where uh, estimating is an iterative process in which you know, we, we get assigned or we, 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 we define some scope early on in the process. That leads to some design and engineering efforts from those design and engineering efforts, uh, the output of those are some drawings and some models. And then from those drawings and models, we pull out quantities and those quantities then are used to, to drive cost estimates where they're combined with other resources and, and, and assumptions or approximations about productivity. And, and we do that when the, when the plans and the design and engineering is at 30%. We repeat the entire process at about 60%, and then we go through it again at about 90%. So lots of iterations. We're doing the same stuff over and over and over, and it's not that clean progression as we saw on the previous screen where you're simply going from one stage to the next stage to the next stage. For instance, as we morph from 30% complete to 60% complete, do we have a lot of visibility into what actually changed? I've sat in a lot of offices where information gets summarized. If you want to think about an accordion, at 30%, we're doing our design and the engineering and the accordion is pulled out where we've got a pretty good understanding of the scope. And then, you know, we get another iteration of plans where things are a little bit more compressed. And, and do we really have a one-to-one? -one? Do we know what's changed in this iteration from the last iteration? Some of that we can control ourselves. If we're an owner that does our own engineering for our projects, we've got a, a hand in it. We're an EPC where we do the engineering, we do the procurement, and we're gonna do the construction. Maybe there are some uh, facilities or some economies of scale that are built into those models. In a lot of cases, maybe we're disconnected. Maybe we're a contractor and we're disconnected from the owner and the engineer and we're just in a responsive mode as these iterations of design come out, um, I've seen organizations literally start all over because they, they've summarized the information to a point where new data elements coming in don't really uh, make sense uh, because they're coming in at a different level of detail than how they've already summarized stuff. So let's take a look and we're going to talk about how the business value associated with our integrated project controls platform. And a couple of the things I wanted to talk about uh, are that you know we've, we've got a, a, a model pro product and we've got an estimating product, but they, they overlap in a lot of key workflows. So as we're going through the business process of understanding how the model works and understanding the data elements that are in the model, this can already be associated with a cost estimate. So, for instance, one of the things that, that we, would, we would typically want to do is we'd want to take the, the estimating line items and we'd want to draw a relationship between those and the data elements that are in the model. So now we've got sort of joined at the hip, again, across an integrated project controls platform. We've got the ability to, to identify key line items in the cost estimate and to associate those with data elements directly in the model. And then what's going to happen is we can also uh, do data transformations. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but we can sum quantities for particular cost items. We can identify which model objects relate to which line items in the estimate. Um, and you can see some mock-ups here on the, on the screen, what the, the actual screenshots would look like here. I want to sum the volume. Uh, it's going to go out to an aid estimate, and we're going to sum it based on volume in this case. Um, and then what we can do is, as, as we've gone through a few iterations, as those design elements change, it's very easy because we've already created the associations of the model elements to the line items in the estimate, we can see how the quantities might vary as we're getting updates of, of, our, of our electronic model. We can see how those quantities are now different than what's over here in my, in my estimate. 
So again, I don't have to go trying to compare spreadsheets. I'm not trying to, to, to take data at one level of detail and either summarize it up or roll it out to a different level of detail. I've got this nice one-to-one -one that I've established and I can see really quickly visually which ones are out of sync and there's an accept button right there. And if I wanted to push the updated model quantities into the cost estimate, it's, it's really literally one click away at this point. So now my estimate has been updated with my model quantities. And as we talked about earlier, that is an iterative process, right? So maybe I've, I've set this up early when we've got our, our plans at 30%. I've pulled in that data. Now on the estimating side, I'm doing my, my bottoms up cost estimate, right? I'm looking at each of these line items in the estimate and I'm making assumptions about what sorts of resources are we going to use to be able to build this work? Are we going to do this work ourselves? Or are we gonna hire a subcontractor? So all of this stuff is now available for me to start putting together iterations of my estimate as the iterations of the plan are coming through. So for each of these line items, I can be thinking about all of the different types of materials, the parts, the pieces, the bits that are going to make those up. I can pull in from my estimating history and, and I can have templates for this kind of work. Every time we're going to be doing a, a horizontal slab, this is what I want to bring in. These are the elements that I want to bring in. And all of those elements would now be adjusted to those quantities that I'm receiving directly from the model. So again, as we go through the iterations, we'd expect this process to allow us to keep the estimate in sync with the electronic model. What's also interesting about this is as I'm interacting with the estimate, I can highlight or select an item in the estimate and I can see the associated model elements that are related to that line item. And this can really give me a lot of additional context. Not only can I ensure that I've made associations between those appropriate model elements and the cost estimate, but it does give me some more context to maybe strategize as I'm putting my cost estimate together. Is it, is it possible to phase these operations? Is it, is it clear that some of this stuff has to be done before other elements? So again, I can isolate uh, certain elements in the model and, and really, really drive home how those are related to my cost estimate. So again, depending on what level of detail and how much information I have linked up in the model to the cost estimate, I can see those elements, you know, they basically turn on and turn off in the model as I'm selecting line items in the estimate. We can even roll up to a higher level. You can see there's sort of a, a parent-child relationship between all of these detail line items in the estimate. And in this case, I'm just saying, hey, just show me all of the, the, the stuff that I've labeled as concrete that's gonna be part of these, these foundations and part of this, this initial uh, pour of concrete. So again, it gives me great context as an estimator if we're working in teams. Um, where there maybe is an estimating team and a design team, uh, the information just flows that much more easily. We don't have to set up special meetings to say what's included in this value, what's not included in this value. Someone just need to click on the item in the estimate and that, that gives them the visibility that they're looking for over on the model side. We also realize that there's other things you're going to want to do with the model data um, in addition to what's already been provided by the engineer. So for instance, we can apply metadata, which are simply tags or labels to selected model elements. So we call these data transformation operations and we, we would be a, a viable software company if we didn't live in the world with three letter acronyms. So these are sometimes referred to as DTOs. And I'll give you a couple of examples of, of some DTOs that I've, I've seen implemented by our customers. Um, and if you think about you know, any of these large capital projects, there, there's going to be a lot and a lot of information. So why do we want to apply metadata? We want to apply metadata so that we can easily organize things based on a common attribute. 
We want to apply metadata so that if we just want to filter down to a list of certain things that, that meet a certain criteria, we can easily do so. We don't have to run through each line item in the estimate and wonder, well, how is this, how does this affect the other one? Um, so again, these are maybe data elements that are not of interest to the model author or the original engineer. So a really good example of that might be, which subcontractor are we going to get to perform the work? Um, you know, again, the business value there is I can apply it once, I can, I can do a data transformation operation to, to make sure that we know that. So on the receiving end, on the estimating side, that value is there. Or if I knew that we were gonna maybe consider a different contractor, I could, I could click on those things in the estimate that are associated with that particular sub, and it would again highlight those things in the model that would be of interest to me. You know, another common one is, you know, we're going to be we're going to be installing some materials and the model knows the relative height of these things. Right. So I can say, hey, everything that's over or, or these selected items that are over 25 feet in height or eight meters in height, however you want to determine that you can then associate a crane with those. Right. So we want to make sure that. Um, you know, we don't miss anything or, or if I wanted to see what, what is a crane required for in this model, I could, I could highlight those, those items. And that's a function of applying these uh, data transformation operations as well. Um, when is the work scheduled to begin? So again, the original author, the engineer might not have visibility into start dates and, and the phasing of the work. Um, but now as I'm starting to take the, the model into consideration as I'm building out my estimate, now we can integrate that with a schedule as well. And we can, we can do these three or four week or three or four month look aheads, depending on where we are, what state of the project we're at. And we can, again, we can, we can attach metadata to the elements in the model that are gonna flow through and surface in the cost estimate as well. Another thing I wanna talk about, the, the title of this presentation was, you know, stop stop project surprises by, by using an integrated uh, project controls platform. One of the things I think we do very well in our set of, of tools is we provide benchmarking. And the business value there is it's so much easier and so much less painful to validate cost estimates against your organizational history. Um, so, for instance, we can label certain items a certain way and we know, hey, if we're going to be pouring this horizontal non-supporting concrete slab that is between four and eight inches thick, we can look at our history of not only estimating, but executing that sort of work as well. And what that's going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to create smart cost item assemblies. So interview-based takeoff, I can, I can run in, answer a few questions about how the work is going to be performed. And it's also going to help me, again, much more easily validate our estimates as compared to our history. So for instance, if I, if I click on a line item in the estimate, I should be able to see, wow, here we are down here at uh, somewhere around 50 units per man hour but our average is, is well above that at about 102 units per, per man hour. So that's interesting. I've, my estimate doesn't really feel that validated in this case. Maybe I've missed something. Maybe I'm, I'm assuming that uh, my assumptions, maybe my assumptions are incorrect. So this average is really combining these individual data points. You can see there's a data point here for, for the, the circles are as estimated values, the triangles are as built values. So again, we're not only combining the model and the cost estimate, but now we're also looking at our own collection of history and we're able to see, aha, you know, this doesn't fit into that sweet spot that we have identified that's a, uh, you know, between zero and 9% variance from my average. So we want to thank you for coming in. I know I'm running up to my 20 minute mark here. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And please be sure to stop by our virtual booth. My associate Joe Hamill is, is providing coverage for that. And Joe and I will both be available after this session for any kind of Q&A 
uh, and that's going to happen in about 30, 40 minutes from now. So again, thank you so much for taking time out for us. And thank you to the CAMBIM folks for having us uh, talk today. We really appreciate the opportunity.